I'd like to introduce our first session. Although he's a man who needs no introduction, having appeared at the RTS many times, I'd like to welcome Gerhard Seiler, President of International at Warner Brothers Discovery and my boss. <laughs> Gerhard will be talking to Nina Hussain and will, I'm sure, give us his perspective, not only on the future for Warner Brothers Discovery, but also bring his wealth of experience to bear on the wider set of issues on the agenda today. As we welcome Nina and Gerhard to the stage, we'd like to share a short video that brings to life the powerful storytelling and creative engine at the heart of Warner Brothers Discovery. Let's take a look. The future. I can see it. Are you ready to fly? I'm ready. Ready to fly. It began with a dream to build an entirely new kind of media company. To do more than entertain, but to inspire and to grow. It just all feels pretty great. This is the dream that gave rise to Warner Brothers Discovery, to give new opportunities to our greatest storytellers. But we have some big news. To give new purpose to our world builders, tastemakers, and culture shapers. It's breathtaking. To give rise to the next generation of dreamers, yes. believers, and innovators worldwide. What are we doing? Changing, Changing the world. world. I'll be like you someday. You can be anything you want to be. Don't look like a coach. Oh! What do you want out of your future? Everything. Our story starts with you. Just begun. Good morning. Uh, as Priya said, here is a man that I'm with this morning who needs no introduction, uh, but he is here in his role this morning uh, in his uh, role as President International of Warner Brothers Discovery. So uh, please give a, a very warm London welcome to Gerhard Zeiler. Thank you. Thank you. Gerhard, I'd like to start with um, where we're at, really, in terms of six months ago, this big merger happened. What's your big vision for WBD? Look, um, the vision is actually quite easy. We are a content company. We tell stories. We are storytellers, and that's really our DNA. And, and the way we tell stories is really in many, many ways. Yeah? We invested in the theatrical business, so we tell the stories in feature films, we tell the stories in TV series, whether it's scripted or unscripted, in games, we tell animated stories, we tell sports stories, documentaries, and last but not least, uh, we tell the news stories. And as you know, um, besides the BBC, CNN is really one of the, or probably the only other global player um, in news. And without boasting, uh, I, I'm not here to do that, but so bad we are not in this storytelling. Uh, the 48 Emmys we got a couple of weeks ago are the proof of it. Uh, I would say there are three factors in these visions when it comes to storytelling. First is really the press of how we tell stories, what I, I just explained. And the second one, which are probably also the most important success factors, uh, the relevance and the quality of the storytelling. Um, HBO is, is the home for quality now for more or less um, uh, 50 years. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's our vision, that's our mandate, that's our meaning when it comes to the vision. Hand in hand with this vision goes also a certain distribution strategy. Um, when you are invested in so many showers, when you tell stories in so many ways, then at least from our point of view, it makes sense that also your distribution strategy is very broad-based. And that's the reason that we say 100% yes to the theatrical business. We believe in exclusive windows um, for feature films. 
Um, we say yes to the home entertainment business. In what form, whether people want to um, watch it digital or still have the old um, uh, DVD. Uh, in all form of, of networks, whether streaming um, or um, linear networks. And last but not least, we are not a closed shop. Yes, we are very proud that a lot of our products, a lot of our um, content is um, watched and released on our own networks. But we're also selling content. We have a lot of partnerships, especially also here in the UK, where um, consumers can watch what they want um, on other people's networks. So that's a little bit the strategy which goes hand in hand with the vision we have. It's heartening to hear your passion for stories and storytelling. Do you believe in the current climate there is still the appetite for that from the consumer's point of view? Oh, 100%. I, I, we see that, we see that in, in so many ways. I mean, we see what House of uh, the Dragon really got in terms of engagement. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's only one example. You can have a lot of examples, not only in our um, uh, company, also in other companies. I strongly believe that um, the quality of content has increased over the last years everywhere. And that's actually really the best sign for this industry. You've described it before as an explosion of creativity and quality. When you're talking about those, that incredible haul of Emmy wins, 48, is that level of creativity and quality sustainable in the future? better will be. Um, uh, so, I mean, um, uh, the answer is yes. Um, uh, look, you have to have a certain culture in a company that you really get uh, the best creators. And I think um, the way our people are doing that, whether it's Casey Ploys at HBO, whether it's Shenning Dunje um, uh, at the Warner Brothers TV studio, whether it's Mike DeLuca and Pam Apti on the theatrical side, I think to really go out and do whatever you can to bring the best creators in, that's, that's the key element. And to have a culture where people say, yeah, that's a safe place, why I can tell my story, why I can develop something. I mean, we'll never forget how um, Casey told us the story, how uh, a creator came to him and his team and really starting to say, I want to do this show euphoria. Mm. It was actually, um, last year, completely untypical for HBO. He tried it out. It was a success, but it was not overwhelming. And the second season was we, it was, we were blown away by the success of it. And this trust in creators is so important for this industry. You mentioned the uh, theatrical ambitions and, and arm. How much of that do you need a crystal ball to kind of assess what the, the post-pandemic audiences and consumers are going to do in, in terms of that? First of all, everyone who ever believed that um, the theatrical business, that the cinema is dead, mm. has been proven wrong um, so many times and also will be proven wrong in the future. Um, the theatrical business is here to stay, and that's good so. Um, yes, of course, the pandemic changed, and we see that um, at the numbers. Not everyone um, is still feeling safe to go back to the cinema, or if she and he goes back, it has to be really a, a big film. Um, when I look at the numbers of um, the, the film releases so far, you see that you have less movies in the cinemas, but the big ones had a much better success than anybody would have um, forecasted before. Mm. So it's really about must have when it comes um, uh, to the film um, um, strategy, to the feature film strategy. Look, is it a, uh, can you predict it? Oh, that would be nice, yeah? Um, uh, that's not possible in the creative industry. Yeah. Mm. But if you stick to, um great storytelling, then the audiences will follow by the sound. If you stick to a certain culture where you make great storytelling possible, mm. then the chances that you have success are bigger than um, if you don't do that. Just a point on the, the business, the new business in general. Uh, it's a, a real mix of different brands and business models, especially in comparison 
to some of your peers. Is that a strength or is that a weakness? It may seem complex, but for me, I, I, I call it diverse. I call it diversity. We don't believe um, that it makes sense to put all the content we have into one window. We don't believe that's what the consumer wants, and no believe that no do we believe that this is a good business case. We are not a one-trick pony. Um, uh, we believe in the breadth of our distribution strategy, and this is not only in alignment with our content offering, with our really breadth of content offering. It's also aligned with the with the brands we have. There's probably not. There are not a lot of other companies who have as many global brands as we have. And these global brands are different. Think of Warner Brothers, think of HBO, think of CNN, think of Discovery, think of Cartoon Networks. They all have their own fans and, and viewers. Mm -hmm. And we believe it makes sense to let them decide where they want to follow us, where they want to consume our product, uh, where, where they want to be passionate um, about it, not to decide it has to be on one platform only. Those brands that you mentioned, incredibly successful, powerful brands, that as you say, people will follow specific brands or all of them or some of them, how difficult will it be to create the next tranche of incredibly powerful, successful brands? I think we are happy with our brands. Um, what we have, I mean, it's, it's really broad. Um, uh, where we will focus is probably more the development of franchises. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, it's, yes, we have also an incredible slate of franchises. Think of the world of Harry Potter, the visiting world. Think of DC, think of Looney Tunes and animation series. But there we need to develop more. Think of Game of Thrones, which House of the Dragon is one spin-off of that. And who knows, maybe there will be different ones and, um, and additional ones. That's where we focus on, yeah? but the brands we have, whether it's what I said, one about the CNN, um, HBO, to keep the quality and also um, the, the shiny quality of these of brands, that's for sure a task which we have to execute. Um, in the next years. Mm, I think there's lots of uh, Game of Thrones fans who are very happy that that uh, journey is being kept alive right now and possibly into the future. You've mentioned some of those massive global franchises. Where does local programming fit into that mix and into your vision? I think there is one rule um, in our industry. If you want to be a successful global player, you have to all have also relevant local stories. Uh, I mean, don't misunderstand me. The big hits will always be the Batmans, the Elvis, the Black Adams, which premiere next month here in the UK. Um, uh, it will be the Succession, the Euphorias, the House of the Dragons. But I think in order to be really a top three player, you need to complement these big hits also with local relevant stories. Maybe not in every single market of the world, but in a lot, yeah? and in our company, I mean, we are new to the streaming business or relatively young. Uh, we launched um, HBO Max two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago in the US, mm -hmm. um, uh, and then a year ago started internationally. Discovery Plus was launched in November 2020, so we're young, but we already have some successes in this local, um, in this local storytelling. Yeah? Can you give me some examples, give the audience some I mean, examples. there are, uh, we have two, we have really three Spanish examples which were, which we are very proud of. One is 30 Coins, which is a horror sci-fi um, story which was even successful at HBO in the US. One is Patria, it's, it's, a, it's a family drama um, in the times of the ETA terrorism in Spain. Mm -hmm. One is which we launched a few weeks ago, Save the King, about a documentary about all the, let's say, scandals of the former um, King of Spain. Very interesting. Yeah. I didn't know everything I mean, um, about that. Um, and uh, we did similar things in, 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 um, in Latin America, Las Bravas, which is a, um, a story of an ex-soccer um, football star who really took the, t um, the task on 
to develop and train um, a female soccer um, a team. And you know, there's nothing more powerful in Latin America than soccer. Mm. Yeah? And these are only a few examples of what we did. But the local stories are not only um, focused on, on the streaming side of the business. I mean, you, you know, everyone who runs a broadcaster know that a local broadcaster without local stories will never be successful. And it's also on the theatrical side. We have a history at Warner Brothers to, to develop and launch and release really strong local films. For example, in Japan last year, we had almost 60 million box office only with local titles. In Germany, we do at least um, have a top five film, um, local feature film in the top five of the country. And here in the UK, I mean, Operation Mincemeat was really good ones. And we have two more coming, um, one on the 7th of October, um, The Lost King, mm -hmm. about um, a story about a, an amateur historian who proved the world of British historians wrong and proved that the remains found in 2012 under Carbach was the, were the remains of King Richard III. I didn't know the story. Yeah? When I saw the film, it was, it was um, eye-opening. Yeah. So on that, that's a really good example, isn't it? The commissioning process, are you thinking, are the creatives talking about local content for local audiences? Are they also twin-tracking that with thinking this story could travel the world, could have a global impact? Of course. I mean, um, uh, um, since, the, um, uh, since um, uh, the story, the, the few really big successes which um, Netflix had with local stories who really went global, this is possible. But again, I don't think you can plan it. Mm. Yeah? Um, I think the, the commissioning has to be on a local base, but every single creator, at least on our side, is thinking, oh, maybe this can be at least a regional hit or um, really travel to other regions or, um, and also to the US. And how do you get that sense that if a local audience is, is watching it, appreciating it, talking about it, that it is worth trying to get out there to a, a global audience? First of all, everything what we produce locally on the streaming side, or 99%, um, uh, is automatically day and day released in, in all the regions where we have HBO Max. And the same on the Discovery Plus side. So we have the product, uh, we have the content already on our service. And if something really gets traction in the local market, we can do a lot of um, marketing on our own platform and other um, networks we have in order to um, try to really accelerate that. But it's, you can't, you, you don't know beforehand mm. whether this will be a success or not. How important is the UK market to you right now as, as this, this company has merged and become this, uh, this um, collaboration now? I mean, Priya said that before, we are invested for so many years in the, in the, in the UK. And the UK is by far the biggest market outside the US in terms of revenues, in terms of people, employees we have, in terms of businesses. I mean, think of our networks business. Um, 19 linear channels, mm. plus the four which we now have in the joint venture with BT Sports. Yeah, so 23, if you count it together. Think of CNN, the biggest hub outside the US. Um, think of the games uh, my industry. We have two studios here, TT Games and Rocksteady Studios. Um, think of Leaveston. Uh, and not only the Harry Potter tour, which attracts millions of visitors every single year. We have 21 sound stages there. And what I didn't know before, we have the biggest um, heated underwater pool for filming, yeah? whatever this is necessary for. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, at least, we, um, at least that's, uh, that's part of the description. Yeah? And um, think of, think of our, our production we have. Yeah? Um, uh, LGI and I own 50% of, of all three media, and whether it's wall to wall, 2020, um, uh, Ricochet, these are production companies we own, 
and we want to grow them and we will grow them. And then there are a few stories. It's not only the formats which we get from the US, it's also, I, I really love the story of, of the repair shop, which mm. started as a, as a small BBC Two um, daytime show and is now a hit on BBC One. Yeah? So these things are really the pride of our creative people here in the UK. And, and last but not least, the partnerships. We have so many partnerships. Um, our companies create um, a lot of content for Channel 4. We have a, a strong partnership uh, with the BBC, whether it's the natural history part, whether it's some co-production like industry, I think which premiered or will premiere um, just now, a co-production between HBO and BBC. And of course, the, the partnership with Sky, with a huge amount of co-production and also um, a deal where more or less our home in terms of Warner Brothers and HBO is really Sky. And this is, this is sometimes funny because um, the partnership is really great. Um, I am, I'm a Sky customer here. Mm. Um, and every single year, as probably a lot of you, or probably every single year, you get a letter from the CEO explaining why the prices is going up for one or two. Yeah? And in this last 10 years why I followed it up, there's at least 50% of the justifications of the shows are from Warner Brothers Discovery. <laughs> One year, it was 100%. That was the time when I brought this letter to my then boss, um, uh, John Stanke, and said, look, they're having a good time with us. Yeah? <laughs> so um, what I want to say is the partnership is really great for both sides. Yeah? And yes, but the but, um, uh, Stephen will, will be not mad at me when I say, one day, yeah, um, uh, we probably, and I say it very careful, very vaguely, <laughs> we probably also want to have a streaming service in the UK, okay. outside Discovery Plus. Okay, in, in terms of the right here, right now, that relationship, that partnership with Sky, how has that, or how will it be affected by uh, you, you expanding and, and getting BT Sport, the you know, rival. I think um, Sky is part of this, of this deal because there were a huge amount of negotiations until all deals are done. Um, I, it was before my time, but I heard it was a very, very complex um, transaction. Yeah? Um, uh, the person or one of the persons who did this deal or negotiated the deal, um, uh, I sent now to Asia because he has to I'm a, a little bit get out of the UK negotiations with Sky and BT, um, but it it was, um, um, it's. <laughs> this is I think the the good thing of our in, the, in our industry is. And that's the difference to some other digital businesses, the winner doesn't take it all, it's always good, um, uh, that there is competition. And I think it's also for Sky good that, there's not, that they are not the only player um, in, in sports. There's a second one too, and that's us and, and, and BT. Okay, and in, in terms of, um, as you know, we've got a new prime minister and a new government at the moment in, in the UK. Is there anything from the government's point of view in terms of policy going forward or any other thing in the landscape that would make the UK, in terms of investment opportunities, more attractive or even more attractive? to the company? Oh boy, now I come into difficulties when I really answer this question. Um, look, the UK is such a strong market for us and also for the industry that I don't think this will change a lot um, going forward. Um, would it be helpful if the government really knows that this industry is really an important one for the whole economic situation in, um, in the country? I think so, uh, but um, I leave it to everyone who is based here to tell the government exactly that story, so we will also profit from them, that you're telling um, them that. So I don't think will, there will be a huge amount of change, and I never believed very much the um, or some of the um, some of an announcement of the previous government, and don't let me get into the details here, mm. um, uh, about the future developments and the media industry in this country. Okay, I promise not to push <laughs> you on that. Uh, uh, what I will push you on, though, is uh, in terms of WBD. What does 
success from your point of view look like if we fast forward to five years from now, ten years from now? I mean, whoever knows David Saslav knows that he's very ambitious. And we are an ambitious company. So what we want is, and that's, the, that's only the headline, we want to be a top three media player. And I personally would be really disappointed if there's the number three in front of our ranking. Uh, but this is only the headline. What really success means is, is a different form. First of all, we have, as, as everyone else, get the transition from linear to digital, from linear to streaming, right. Now, a lot has changed also in the streaming um, part of our industry, as you know. First of all, the most important thing from my point of view, it's a competition now. Um, a few years ago, there was no competition. There was only one player, de facto. Mm. Uh, now it's a competition, and that's good so. Uh, the second is that, yes, the focus on global subs is still there, but global subs are not the only KPI anymore. It's also about Apple, it's about revenue, it's about a path to profitability. And I think we all who are really invested in that have to prove to our investors, to the market, that we can be successful in streaming, but also um, having a financial uh, responsibility. Um, that's, that's what we need to do. And when it comes to streaming, so let's not, this is still and will be um, one of the most important, if not the most important business line, what we have. And everybody knows every single month, the number of TV minutes which are watched via streaming is growing. But even if you look at the US, which is one of the markets which is fast um, progressed in that, the majority of TV minutes are still watched on linear. So it will take time, yeah? And in this time, we need to offer um, uh, our viewers, our consumers, both alternatives, wherever they want to watch it. And um, uh, last but not least, um, we have the special task that, you know, we have two streaming um, platforms, Discovery Plus and HBO Max, and we will bring that together in the next year to one combined product before we then launch in new markets. And how concerned are you in the current financial climate that Priya touched upon, where people are scrutinizing, certainly in this country, their household budgets, and they're scrutinizing and being told by uh, people who are giving financial advice that actually the thing that you should be really looking at is do you really need all those different packages, all those different streamlining services, streaming services? I don't think it makes sense to be concerned. You have to be must have. And that's also um, uh, the third part of how success looks like. We need and we want in five years to have the same amount of quality shows and all the shows we have um, uh, going forward. And we need to create this creative culture we have in our company. Uh, if we can do that and if we uh, are doing it right and executed it well, um, I'm not concerned that our services will not be um, acquired, will, our programs will not be watched. That's also what our, um, how we believe our success will look like. And the foundation of the assets we have, I talked about that, and the creative leadership we have in our company um, makes us all incredibly optimistic um, going forward in the future. Will there be obstacles? Of course. Will it be easy? No way. And there will be some obstacles we can control, some, like the economic situation, we can't control. Mm -hmm. But if we deliver must-have um, content, um, I'm not worried about our future. If you just take the WBD hat off for a minute and, and look back at your years and decades of experience in, in the global television industry, I want to leave the audience with this whole convention is about the fight for attention. So what's your perspective on that landscape from the point of view of, of industry leaders right now fighting for that space in, in these tricky times? Um, first of all, um, I don't know when it was the first time. It must have been um, at the age of the first internet bubble, 1999, 2000, 
why I heard for the first time, oh, TV will be dead. Yeah? TV is still not dead and won't be dead. And only how it's watched changes. But we have seen in the last 20 years, even in this world, um, what I call the consumer's world powered by technology, that behaviors of um, consumers is, is not radically shifting. It's shifting slowly. And that's again is for me the importance that we have. The whole industry has to play on all um, pianos, on all platforms. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing. And, and the second thing um, I would say is we had so many discussions in the last 20, 30 years about who is the real king? Is it content or is it distribution? Now, what I believe um, in this consumer's world, it's about content, it's about distribution, it's about product. No consumer wants to need 30 clicks, or 13 clicks in order to get to the product, and price. All that is a package. Content still probably the most, or for sure in my opinion, the most important ones. And last but not least, the time where nice to have is enough is over. It's now really must have. If you deliver the must have product, if you deliver the must have content, um, you are a winner. And that's what competition is about. And I'm glad that our industry is a competitive um, industry. So focus on the quality, uh, Gerhard Zeiler. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this morning. Thank you very Good. much. Thank you.